when I was really young, I was just so myself, like going to kindergarten, I would wear red lipstick and blue eyeshadow and a fairy, fairy wings and a mermaid tail and everyone else was wearing normal clothes and I didn't care and I just loved it. Um, and then but by the time I got to like the end of primary school, high school, like absolutely did not want to be noticed and would just try to like wear the normalest clothes and just not be noticed. And then so off, straight away once I finished high school, then I just like spent a lot of time trying to reconnect to myself because I knew I had just like pushed everything down because I don't know, I guess school's hard and um and then I just started just working on myself again and I finally feel like I'm back to <laughs> back to young Jaleesa again. Zero fucks. <laughs> That's Jaleesa Vincent. I'm Jamie Brissick. This is Soundings, brought to you by The Surfer's Journal. The Journal is a member-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from FCS, Finisterre, Howler Brothers, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, and Yeti. More like a book than a magazine, The Journal delivers 136 pages of independent storytelling every eight weeks, covering the people, culture, travel, and art of surfing. If you want to learn more, if you'd like to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. 25-year-old Jaleesa Vincent is a free surfer and a free spirit. She grew up on the Sunshine Coast of Australia. She shapes, paints, draws, does taxidermy, makes films, and plays in a band. She made a film with her partner titled Macaroni in the Pot. She's part of the Rage Gang. What is the Rage Gang? We'll listen on and you will find out. Jaleesa, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> um, so I guess, you know, a place to start is what uh, what's firing you up? What's inspiring you right now? Um, what's inspiring me right now? Well, right now I'm kind of in like a pretty chill um, position. I've injured my um, knee. I just tore my MCL. So I'm kind of enjoying a bit of a break and not – having like pressure on myself to go surfing and obviously it's sad and I miss surfing but I've just been loving like um, doing painting and making music and enjoying the small simple things and living a bit more of a simple life I guess not traveling and um, yeah so I'm just frothing on making music at the moment. Oh that sounds so good you know it's interesting because I think um, I've spent most of my life surfing and I find that uh, it's such it's such an addiction and it's such a reflexive thing that we do that only when I've been injured do I realize that there are other things that can happen when you're not chasing waves all the time. Exactly. I feel like we um, not waste so much time, but we consume so much time looking for waves, being on your phone, checking the winds and traveling. And like, it's crazy how long a day goes for when you're not going surfing. I feel like the days are going so long and I can do so much like get in the garden, do some painting, make some art, cook a nice dinner. And it's like, oh, it's, it's pretty nice. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, so I want to talk to you about music, but just so I kind of have the setting, where where do you live? Where are you right now? Um, I'm living just like in, um, I don't know what you call the general area, but I've only just moved here. So I'm living like an hour south of Coffs Harbour, um, kind of near Crescent Head. Yeah, and, <laughs> it's a nice. And is small it town? Is it so small town? Is it kind of is it rural? Is it like far, sort of farmlands, or is it um, in a town? Yeah, it's a rural. It's a rural town, like on a train track, and a lot of like, I think like a lot of mysterious people. I haven't met many people yet, and whatever. It's just like a one single street of mm -hmm. random rednecks, I guess. Wow. And, what <laughs> and I'm just one of the random people. <laughs> Interesting. What about, um, what kind of, tell me about music. You, so you, you have a band? <clears throat> yeah, I'm in a band at the moment called Cupid and the Stupids. Um, but we've all kind of moved away from each other. So 
we don't get to jam much. Um, but we're going on tour at the end of the year with Grinspoon. Mm-hmm. Do you know them? I know Can't Grinspoon, get yeah. started, chemical hot. Um, so that'll be fun to go on a tour and like get the band members back together. But yeah, we're kind of fizzling out slowly, but. We're releasing an album this year, which will be fun, like nice to get the music pressed and kind of have a physical record to be like, this is what we did. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but then at the moment I've just been making music myself just for fun because I love writing and I, I usually start off writing poetry and then it eventually just turns into a song. I like that. I, I know your song 200 Laybacks. <laughs> very simple <laughs> i no i absolutely love it so 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 songwriting so does it so you start with the words and then you sort of bring your guitar in and then find kind of a melody or rhythm riff usually yeah usually i like every day i just write random splats of poetry that pops up into my head and then randomly one day it might all just link up into a song and and then i like, on the other side, I might come up with a little guitar riff and then like somehow it all ends up just bouncing together and making one. So it's fun. I don't know how it works. It just all seems to work. <laughs> Do you kind of have um, words and music in your head all the time? Yeah, pretty much. I've always kind of walked around kind of just singing little songs and like when I was little, I feel like I used to <laughs> pretend I was like living in like a music video. <laughs> I think that was like my fantasy world. I'd like walk around and be like, oh, I'm so sad. Oh, I'm so in love. <laughs> and um, like everything was just like emotionally like connected to music, I guess, in a weird way. <laughs> I relate to that. I don't make music of my own, but I can't believe how how charged I can be by music and have a song in my head really dictate my mood. And unfortunately, I gravitate towards a lot of more melancholic music. Yeah. Um, so sometimes the songs I have in my head are are maybe what what some might call dark, but they're they're not upbeat. It's not like playful hip hop. It's more like you know Neil Young or Bob Dylan ballads. Yeah. But I um I do find having how the the charge is kind of amazing, and I've always been fascinated by people who do make their own music because that kind of like forming of something, right? Like you you hear. You've got a couple words. You've got some 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 melody, some little riff, and then you, it just sort of forms and grows. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. You can just hear it. It's like so weird. Especially sometimes I listen to a song. And I'm like, and even other songs. I'm like, oh, I would just so add this extra layer. I can just hear it there. <laughs> like maybe a backup singer just going, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. How did you find your way to that? Did, did you always play music? Um, no, I'm not like innately a very good musician. I just love music and like I said, I can hear it, but I'm like, I've never been able to like sing in key or nicely, you know, a choir would hate me. Um, and I've only been learning guitar the last couple of years, but I grew up as a dancer when I was younger. So I guess I always like danced to music and then and my favorite dancing was tap dancing. So that was kind of my first instrument, I guess, like per- percussion. And then when I was like 18, I learned to play the drums to add to my percussion, I guess. And because I so wanted to be in a band and I couldn't play guitar and I couldn't sing. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then I started a band called Screech with my friend Isaac, and we played like kind of heavy metal screamo. <laughs> um, and I played the drums and screamed. And then Cupid and Stupids came along by like all my friends. They were in a band and they had to change their name. And and then I was like, if you're changing your name, I'm joining the new band to whatever you change it to. And I'm going to be a tap dancer. (laughs) (laughs) And so, yeah, that's how I got in the band. (laughs) And did you grow up in a family that encouraged you creatively? Yeah, um, my family was super encouraging. They weren't necessarily like creative people like my mum is a seamstress and a very like do 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 it yourself um so she would make all my clothes and if I if we ever wanted something she'd be like why would we buy this we could just make it so I guess that was inspiring but like not necessarily in a way that there were musicians or surfers or artists but like a very like just do it yourself kind of which 
definitely like influenced me, I guess. And you grew up on the Sunshine Coast? Yes, yeah. And, and, cool on the beach. and was was the environment that you grew up in encouraging in that way or were they or did you have the sense of like you're, you're the weirdo in the in the in the neighborhood? A bit of both. Um, I luckily had like a really awesome group of friends and and my brother's friends like they're all in bands and um, I grew up with like a creative bunch of people and yeah we'd all kind of like bounce off each other and like get really excited on art and music um and then so that was like our own little bubble and then outside the bubble everyone was pretty vanilla I think and like I would just yeah feel pretty weird I guess (laughs) Mm -hmm. who were your heroes growing up um mm, that's a broad question I guess Growing up from a younger age, the, the first movie I watched was Rocky Horror Picture Show because that was the only DVD my parents had. Um, and there was, like, a tap dancer on there and she had, like, a... I've only realised this recently that, like, she must have been my, like, hero subconsciously because she had, like, this, like, orange bob would wear, like, a sequin suit and, like, tap dance and, like, sing with this high-pitched voice. And then I was, like, listening to one of my songs and I was like, oh, my God, like... I think she must have innately been my, like, hero. Um, and I loved that movie, how, like, fabulous all the costumes were and that, like, opened my eyes to, like, that world and I was just like, oh, my God, it's so cool and all the music and, like, just it really, like, embodies just loving yourself and who you are. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So growing up watching that was, like, I don't know, I love that movie. <laughs> that, those That's a... That's a good influence um, at what I'm imagining was a young age for you, because I think, um, I don't know, just thinking about like deep self-expression, it, it, people spend an entire lifetime trying to get in touch with that um, or, or they live in denial of it. But I think what, what I don't know you, but knowing a little bit of your surfing, your music making, your art making in general, you seem to be very much in touch with like a deep, a a voice within um, a kind of inner life. Mm. And it's impressive to see at you at such a young age to to really just be be kind of like in that living in that and and listening to that um because not everyone does that yeah well i think like i had that when i was really young i was just so myself like going to kindergarten i would wear red lipstick and blue eyeshadow and a fairy fairy wings and a mermaid tail and everyone else was wearing normal clothes and I didn't care and I just loved it um and then but by the time I got to like the end of primary school high school like absolutely did not want to be noticed and would just try to like wear the normalest clothes and just not be noticed and then so after straight away once I finished high school then I just like spent a lot of time trying to reconnect to myself because I knew I had just like pushed everything down Mm -hmm. because I don't know I guess school's hard and um and then I just started just working on myself again and I finally feel like I'm back to (laughs) back to young Jaleesa again Mm -hmm. zero fox (laughs) Mm But I'm still growing and learning every single day. (laughs) Yeah. But I think that, I mean, I think just the willingness to sort of put yourself out there is a big thing. And I think, um, we, we now live in a time, at least in my life where, where the, the term, like we recognize that failure can be good or just, just simply like putting things out there can, whether they're good or bad is part of it, I think. Um, whereas I think, I think part of that actually relates to the fact that there's social media and now we have platforms to put stuff out every day if we want to. The generation I grew up in, you couldn't do that. Like if you had a band, you had to like get studio time to record that piece and that cost money. And then you had to like put out a record and everything around it. Whereas now you can like write a song at home and express it that day. But I think that being, being in touch with that and being sort of just willing to throw yourself out there is um, it's a wonderful place to live. Yeah, I um, I kind of value the how you're saying it used to be too because I feel like everything you put a lot of time, like I feel like kind of art is my life and I do so many paintings and I hate that I can just put it straight on Instagram, you know, like I really want to focus on having art shows and movie premieres and live gigs and 
Um, cause I value the more connection with like humans instead of, you know, like I don't really care. I don't know. It's weird. Like I, I hate that we're so connected on social media. Yeah, <laughs> It's cool that I can like, um, reach a larger audience, but, um, it just doesn't quite feel the same. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's digital versus like, uh, flesh and blood and heartbeats, you know? Um, yeah, exactly. but, but like when you, when you play with your band and you play shows and so then you have actual people in the room, does that, what's, how does that feel? Yeah, it's so fun. Um, I, I feel like I'm kind of bad at communicating and like, I don't know, I'm like, I was like so no, nervous to even like come on this podcast, but then like being on stage, I, I don't know, I guess I must have like an alter ego, I guess. And I can just like, just. I just feel like I lose myself and just rock out and it's just so fun. <laughs> and then like having the audience there, like interacting. Sometimes it's terrible gigs and you're just like, you're not connected with the audience. Mm-hmm. And then, but that's also a good challenge too because you're like, well, I, I'm i sure there's like one or two people in the audience that are liking it and I'm just going to play for them and myself and just enjoy it myself <laughs> yeah. and not care that no one is smiling or nodding their heads or anything. And I'm just like, fuck it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that unto itself, I think is, is liberating that. Um, I don't know. There's something very liberating about, I guess, or just not taking yourself too seriously, just being willing to be a fool in front of people is there's something like once you, once you've like, gotten comfortable in that place then that you can't there's nowhere to fall because you've already you're you're sort of living like under the assumption that I'm already exposing myself and I'm already a fool you know yeah like you can judge me but I like I I'm already like I, I'll just well like all all my band is so playful and like we'll just all laugh after a song be like oh my god like um, I don't know. We just have fun with it and it's a good, it's a really good environment. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, what do you, what do you play in the band? Um, I tap dance on a tap board that we plug into a guitar amp so we can like turn it up and sing and tambourine. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Let's leap over to surfing. When, when, when did you ride your first wave? Um, I think I rode my first wave when I was six. Just like got pushed onto a wave and stood up and rode it. Um, but I didn't really get into surfing till I was probably like 10, I think. Yeah. And with the tap dancing background, was it and a dancing background in general? What did you take to it easily? Yeah, I think I took to it easily. Um, the da- like I, I was so into dancing that I had no time to surf. And it, it, there was one stage in um, when I was like, I think. 10 or like, yeah probably 10 where I was either going to go to Disneyland to dance um or go to the like Australian junior surf titles or whatever and they're at the same time and that's when I had to decide did I want to do surfing or dancing and I went with the surfing um so that was like a hard decision but I'm stoked that I went with the surfing and that was for a competition yeah yeah and do you so I I think of you as a free surfer at l- l- more so than a contest surfer. Do you surf contests at all still? No. Um, oh, sometimes I have to do like this billabong single fin comp because it's part of like the billabong thing, um, which is fun because it's just a single fin comp, but I still like, I just hate competitions. I'll still be like, oh, I don't care. Like this is just for fun. And, but like my heart is just going boom, 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 uh-huh. boom. Um, so yeah, no, I, I hate competition surfing. <laughs> it's so interesting. You know, yesterday was the finals of the WSL and I, and I watched, I was gripped to my computer, my laptop watching the webcast. And so I was really kind of observing the WSL finals with this eye of like, is competition, what does it mean? What, what, what's important? And I do think that it can really pull out super high performance. I mean, watching Felipe Toledo in the final and the him kind of reaching beyond himself for this this like amazing performance was so so fun to watch. At the same time, the judging criteria and sort of has its mandates of like what you're supposed to be doing and thinking about surfing in relation to say dance, where it's sort of like imagine being on a dance floor in a 
and and someone saying this is exactly how we want you to do this when you when what you really want to do is just sort of free form it it's it's just an interesting thing i think for so many of us going surfing is like this very pure form of self expression and the idea of trying to fit it into a box is challenging hmm. yeah well um yeah i just when not cuz i grew up doing competitions cuz i liked surfing and that just seemed the only path to like, you know, being a surfer. I did board riders and then grum comps and then juniors and then so on, so on. Um, and yeah, I just didn't understand the judging. Like I feel like I was like surfing better than the other girls, but they would get higher points because they'd do more turns to the beach. Whereas I'd kind of focus on one big turn or like, you know, just or if I was to do like a 360, like that's not going to get judged or do a little ollie. Like I just, I find the beauty in sporadicness, I guess. And um, um, so, yeah, I just don't think it can be judged. Like I see it as an art form. What I've seen, having watched a lot of surfing over the decades, is when you don't do, when you don't follow the world tour and you're not, your head is not focused on trying to win a world title or a competition – you have kind of this other this other this other sort of space to play and you're i mean just thinking about a lot of the quote unquote free surfers um there are, there are sort of extracurricular interests that that are that you have time to pursue because you're not chasing contests um who who i guess on that note like who are who are the surfers you look up to i guess i look up to like Noah Dean and Creed and I guess well I'm pretty much naming the Rage Boys <laughs> um yeah like I guess the way they like just hunt lap waves and um just try to like just surf all the time and yeah like you're instead of a competition you're just trying to surf as good as you can I guess for the camera but I'm trying not to like think like that otherwise I put too much pressure on myself I'm just like take every surf as it is. Um, but, yeah, I look up to all the Rage Boys, Noah and Creed and Sean and Ellis and I love, like, um, Craig Anderson and Ozzy Wright is a big one. Um, yeah. So, 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 so the surfers that you admire are free surfers, not so much contest surfers, it sounds like. Yeah. I admire um, – I've always admired Steph Gilmore as well, and now Katie Simmers. I've I'm a big fan girl of her. Um, so I guess yeah, they're competition surfers, but they I think they surf so uniquely that like like I watch them as a free surfer in my eyes. Right, right, right. <laughs> like that, I don't think they need competitions. Like I think they're just so entertaining. In yeah. Like, no, I hear you. Uh, I, I surf with Steph Gilmore sometimes when she's in Los Angeles where I live, and. Uh, She's often riding a fish and she's often surfing in a way that doesn't s- seem like she's training for us. It's very expressive. It's very much just sort of her. Um, mm. Talk to me about Rage. I know Creed McTaggart. We did a trip to the Maldives. Bo Foster was on it. Ellis Erickson was on it as well. Ari Brown was on it. All of them free surfers. And I was so impressed, but I know some of them are are part of the Rage crew. And can you just explain for listeners, like, what is Rage is sort of a brand, but it's also kind of a group of people, yeah? Yeah, Rage is a grip pad brand, selling grip pads and, like, merchandise. Um, But, yeah, I think Rage has its own kind of ethos kind of um, of it where, yeah, I feel like there's kind of like the Rage gang, like – where it's like empowering kind of more like underdog surfers, I guess. And I feel like there's a lot of like young people who are really into it and they think it's about being like crazy and drinking and doing burnouts in a car or whatever, which is pretty cute. It's like, I don't know, the misfits um, mm-hmm. of surfing. Um, but it's also just about like just surfing and being cool, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I'm kind of blubbering on now, but um, yeah. <laughs> well, what I know of it is having seen the clips, it's just like incredibly evolved, like event advanced surfing and really kind of just going this, this level of sort of going for broke um, that maybe, mm. maybe surfing with a Jersey doesn't uh, 
encourage as much, right? Like there's there's a level of just like hunting in, insane errors that I've seen all the surfers you mentioned do. Yeah, not necessarily having to like land it, obviously trying to land it, but like, yeah, just going all out. Yeah, going yeah. for broke. And rage is also tra- traction pads? Yeah. Leg ropes? Leg ropes, traction pad, board bags, T-shirts, <laughs> socks. <laughs> yep. Nice. Um, and before you lived where you are now, weren't you, were you around the sort of um, Byron Bay area? Yeah, I was living um, out west of Byron, more towards Lismore for um, three years out in the hills there. It was, yeah, a beautiful area. And um, I had to move out of my house because they were turning it into an Airbnb. And it took me like a year to I couldn't find anywhere to live because renting was just so expensive and I really wanted to live a bit closer to the beach, but it was just so expensive closer to the beach. So I just had to move down here, um, which is nice to like be out of, like where I lived was so nice and peaceful in the hills, but like to go into town was just so stressful and stuff so crowded. And so it's nice to just kind of take a step back and, I do so much traveling anyway, so I look at that as like my kind of experience with humans and um, <laughs> interaction, I guess. Right. There's so much good and really innovative surfing coming out of that, that part of the world. Why do you think that is? Well, I think Byron just like sucks in heaps of interesting people. Um, there's so much going on through art and music and the waves are like so nice there. Um, yeah, I feel like it's got this like energy that like draws kind of, I don't know, heaps of people. They've got a, it's got like a diverse range of absolutely everyone there. So yeah, but the fact that there's a few free surfers from there and there's good waves that like, I can make heaps of sense. Yeah, um, for sure. It's so unfortunate that, that you were like sort of priced out or that the, the real, the real estate became so expensive to live there because from what I know, um, there was a period in the '60s and '70s, which they called, which was referred to as the Country Soul period, where a lot of surfers, like Nat Young among them, sort of left Sydney and moved up there, and kind of did this sort of back to the land living, and it was simple living, and it was, you know, it was in many ways sort of supported by the great all the great surf around there, because if the waves weren't so good, you prob- a lot of the great surfers that moved there would have gotten bored. But I, mm. I, I sort of think that there's been generations now of people coming out of that um and a lot of that experimentation that happens in the water takes up a lot of time and it doesn't allow you to earn a lot of money and to and to be able to now i guess afford there right because it's gotten expensive i was recently visiting my friend derek hind who lives up in the hinterlands and he we were talking about this um but for such a long time, uh, kind of like a lot of like artist, you know, creative hubs around the world, like Berlin or Mexico City or what have you, Williamsburg, New York, at one point was this way. Uh, that area, that sort of no- northern New South Wales around Byron, has always been so great for surfing experimentation. Yeah, there's there's so many amazing waves, and the beaches are so beautiful, and like I guess you can go longboarding at the pass, and and then there's all like the beachy beautiful beaches um yeah it's a it's a beautiful spot um it's funny that like I feel like surfing kind of establishes a town in a way you know like wherever there's a good wave it'll end up being so crowded with people who don't even surf it's it's crazy how that seems to work (laughs) yeah yes what about design what kind of boards have you been riding um at the moment I've been riding like Pretty like short boardy thrusters. Um, I've been um, making a few boards. The boards are like I love like a bit wider, thicker boards, for, like more playful. But yeah, um, I'm keen to try. Now that I've got my sore knee, I, I'll have to start longboarding first. But then I'm keen to start riding some more like single fins and twenties and play around a bit more. I think I'm starting to take surfing a little bit too seriously which like to me is not very serious but like I don't know I really wanted to try some big airs and really like step up a bit um and then now and then like I injured myself trying air reverse and I was just like which I'll still try but I'm keen to just get a bit more playful with it and just slowly ease my way back in (laughs) 
airs and um and knee injuries seem to go hand in hand. So so you were doing an air reverse and did you sort of land and just torque it? Yeah, I just landed like I'm a super back footed surfer and I'm that's I guess I'm always going to lay back and I'm always like I'm like a bit of a spaghetti. Now I've been watching my surfing since I've hurt my knee and that like, oh my god my knee ah like as if I hadn't done it earlier. Like I literally my knees are everywhere popping out. Um and so this one I was like, okay, I gotta go more front footed because I never land anything because I'm always so back footed and I was just like front foot <laughs> and then just like pop and just like went way too front foot and just popped my knee out. Wow. Yeah. Where did you do it at? Uh broken head near okay. there. Hmm. Yeah. I still I still get sucked into the vortex all the time. Even though I live down here, I'm back up there all the time. <laughs> And when you go up, what are your spots? Do you surf the pass? Not really. I hate the pass. <laughs> it's kind of the. It's kind of like the main spot, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I just n- can never get a wave out there, and I get so frustrated. I'm like, like, um, you know, classified, I guess, a pro surfer, and I go out at the pass, and I can't catch a wave, <laughs> and I just like usually just paddle in, just so pissed off, and then I'm like, whatever. That was nice. I saw some dolphins and stuff, like try to see the positive and try to like breathe through it. And every time like I'm never going to surf here again. But I think that's because I go out on a short board and I'm trying to surf, but I need to just like take a long board out or phone me out, just have fun. But there's just too many people. I just get so rattled when I'm surrounded by too many people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As a pro surfer, what are your – I mean, I think I kind of know, but I think it's just an interesting question. But like how, because you don't surf contests, what do you need to sort of do to justify your monthly retainer or whatever deal you're on with your sponsors? Like, is it making clips? Is it getting pictures in websites, magazines? How does it work? Yeah, it's it's pretty weird. Even saying that I'm a pro surfer feels so weird. But um, yeah, I just... Basically, with Billabong, my sponsor, go on trips that they want me to go on and I wear the product and I guess so that's like marketing for them. Um, and then I just I have to make a couple of films a year or usually one film a year um, as like my content piece and, um, and then, yeah, posting on social media and I guess being myself. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It sounds wonderful, <laughs> actually. Can we talk about, is it Macaroni in the Pot? Is that the name of your film? Yeah, that was the name of my film last year. I I really enjoyed, and you and your boyfriend made it together, as I understand. Yes, yeah. And so you went to somewhere in Indonesia, a good left Macaronis. Le- Macaronis. <laughs> hence the title. Um and and so you you surfed a bunch, but then you also made music for it, and I think you were involved in the directing and the editing as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Surfed macaronis for like two weeks, which was so freaking fun. And I feel so sorry for my boyfriend having to sit on the beach and film because um, he's goofy for the two. But he got to surf when I was eating lunch and stuff. But yeah, it was pretty torture for him. Um, but that shows how um, um, awesome and loyal he is to not, like, <laughs> just break up with me. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I just wrote that song when I was in the surf because, like, the lulls were so long. It was, like, 40 minutes in between. So I'd just spend, like, 40 minutes, I don't know, just kind of singing to myself. And I was actually a bit pissed off because all I was doing is kind of laybacks and I – really thought if I was to spend that much time at macaronis, I would lay in some, like, big airs, do air reverses and crazy tricks. And I don't know, I had a really high expectation that I wasn't um, getting to. And so I was kind of pissed off. And then I was just kind of singing that song and then it kind of made me happy. And I was like, fuck it, I'm just going to – this is just how I surf. And I never asked – to be a pro surfer really so this is what you get and I'm having fun and yeah and so that's I just kept singing that song in my head um and then I just started enjoying my surfing and just doing laybacks and getting little barrels and um and then I was like oh I have to record this song <laughs> I like that a, a song it a song in our heads it's like this it's like the secret to the good life just like have good songs in your head and you and you're good 
in a way, but then I'm like, I guess that's why meditation exists because like to have something just on repeat in your head, I feel like I'm like a broken record and I'm like, this mustn't be good for me. Like sometimes I'll just have one word stuck in my head. It's just a random word and it just keeps repeating and I'm like, this mustn't be good. I must be broken. Yeah. I, th- <laughs> I need to meditate. <laughs> no, I know. I think um, that might be like the kind of dark side, the, the kind of like flip side to being creative and having – having a sort of music literally and figuratively in your head, you know, it's um, it can easily switch the other way. Like it's, I think it's like a level of obsession maybe, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's trying to fill in space. Like, so it's not quiet. You're just like, yeah. Yeah. Um, How about making the film? That must've been, I mean, not, not obviously the surfing and obviously the having the music in the song in your head, writing the song, but then like sitting in the room and editing and making and putting it together, uh, Let's talk about that. Was it fun? Yeah, it's super fun. I love making films with my partner, Luca. Um, He's such an amazing creative being and has such a beautiful mind. And I think we work together really well. And it's fun. Like, I don't know, we'll just have dinner and some wine at the table and, like, just talk ideas and talk storylines. And and so editing together is just, like, really exciting. I feel like we're just creating our own little world. And then getting to like make little animations and um, and the music and like just pulling it all together is so fun. That sounds so great. A therapist of mine at one point said the highest expression of being in a relationship was to make art with your partner, which I thought was really lovely because maybe the, the lowest form is, is to, is to be like bickering and fighting and, you know, doing the opposite of allowing your mind to soar, you know? Yeah. Let's talk visual art. You you do a lot of painting, and I think you don't you do some taxidermy as well. Yeah, um, I got into taxidermy kind of in like that COVID time when there was lots of time, um, and I was always I'm um, just like I guess I'm a hoarder and a collector, and I love picking up things in my walks, just like feathers and bones and stuff, and like kind of making little shrines or. And then I got into like, oh, maybe I can glue it together. And then I was like, one day I found a dead rat and I kind of pulled it apart with a knife and then like cleaned the bones and put it back together with super glue. And then I was like, and it looked pretty cool. And then I did some Googling and I found out the easiest way because that was disgusting cutting it up and I like snapped a few bones too. It was pretty hard that you can buy these beetles that, eat flesh and so I ordered some of those online and so I had a box of flesh eating beetles um called domestic beetles they don't eat raw flesh it ha- flesh it has to be dry so I can't put a it's people are like oh my god you're gonna like put a body in there and kill someone and be a murderer and I'm like no uh, <laughs> I if I didn't have um roadkill for them I would give them like dog treats and stuff um so then I found a bat um, that was dead on a piece of barbed wire and I put that in the that was my first one and I put that in the box and they ate all the flesh until there was just bones left and then you can just collect the bones and I put it in peroxide to make them white and clean and then put it back together but it just broke whilst I was moving houses absolutely like broke so I'm like this bat has died like twice now <laughs> wow so when you find the bat do you put it in like what a little box or something or like an aquarium type thing with the with the insects yeah, yeah, just like a little box with like holes stabbed in the top, so to get, give them air. And how? Maybe like a little cup, cap of water for them to drink. <laughs> and then you drop it in, and then how many days before you come in, and it's just basically bones, and all the flesh is gone? I think it took like a month, maybe, but it gets quicker and quicker the more animals you put in there for them, because when they're happy, they breed, and then so they multiply, and, like, by the end of the bat, once they had ate it, I had, like, double the amount of bugs, so then it would be quicker for the next animal, <laughs> which was my partner's snake that died. We put that, we did that one, and so it's, like, a two-meter-long carpet python that we haven't done the bones yet. <laughs> wow. Uh, that's going to be a long process of, like, I don't know, 500 rib cage bones, <laughs> It must be, more, maybe. and then when you, when you, so when you drop it in as a sort of fleshy thing and then you come back and it's, it's just the bones is the bones like in the perfect skeleton, the shape, it hasn't been pushed around. 
It's yeah, no, they they the little bugs they push it around. It's like a just a big pile of okay. puzzle pieces. Yeah. Wow, that's kind of that sounds like loads of fun to be doing in the in the house <laughs> or in the garage or wherever. <laughs> yeah, I haven't done it since I moved into this new house yet. I've got these boxes of dead animals that, and I haven't actually opened them yet. Um, <laughs> they kind of stink, and I'm like, oh, I don't really feel like it right now. But I think it, the time will come where I'll be interested to um, put them back together. <laughs> So you and Luca are driving down the road together, let's say on the way back from surfing and, and you've got an eye out for roadkill. I love this. Yeah. Well, like we'd kind of stop and like say if there's a kangaroo, check if there's a joey in there. Um, Luca is like a, he's a, um, a wildlife enthusiast as well. So am I, but like it's his absolute biggest passion. He makes wildlife films. So kind of works hand in hand. Like if it's alive, we'll try to rescue it. If it's dead, I'll take it and, kind of give it a second life of art, I guess, which sometimes I feel guilty. I'm like, you're probably just meant to die and you, you didn't give me consent to, like, use you. But in another way, I'm like, oh, I get to, like, appreciate the entire, like, animal and see what it looks like as a skeleton and, like, learn from it. And, and like, people see it and be like, holy shit, is that what a bat looks like? And, like... Maybe people were scared of bats, and, but they actually just look like little mini humans with wings and, like, I don't know, maybe they appreciate the animals more, mm-hmm, I guess, mm-hmm. in a positive way of looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> it's also kind of a, a, a nice um, regeneration. What would, be, yeah. what would be a dead animal that might just sort of evaporate on the road gets a kind of life and gets to be viewed and appreciated, yeah. hopefully? Yeah, and eventually, like, they won't last forever and they'll end up just back in the dirt like we all do. Yeah. What about painting? Um, painting is um, so much fun, but I haven't um, – I have, like, a challenge with painting because I, I do put, like, pressure on myself that I'm still trying to get over where, like, I take a long time to finally put the paint on the canvas. Like, I'm scared of doing, like, a shit painting, but I'm – Slowly learning, and Luke has taught me this because he's a very sporadic painting and doesn't care and has so, like, just we'll do a painting whether it's good or bad and then move on and do another one. Whereas I like want to make one like masterpiece. Um, but I'm learning that, like, who cares? Because, like, if it's shit, you can just paint over it and that will just be your first layer. And maybe there'll be a part of the painting that you like and you can leave that part and then paint over the rest and then go again. And, and you could do like a hundred layers until until you're happy with it if you ever are but it's like a really fun like I guess world you create like it takes me back to like being a kid where I used to make like fairy houses and you're back and this is the toilet and this is the concert room and this is that and like I do that in my paintings and it's like it's really fun connecting with like kind of my younger self I guess I like this and do you paint you paint on canvas is it like acrylic oil paintings what what gouache um, I'm, <laughs> I mainly use oils, um, on canvas, but if I'm like camping or something, we'll usually take like charcoals and mm-hmm. a book of papers and just do charcoal drawings. And then if like I find, have any that I like, maybe I'll take it home and like add some painting, paint to it. Or, um, yeah, kind of, I use anything, but mainly oil paint. Mm-hmm. Are, are there any painters that inspire you that you look, look up to or, you know, look, look at their work and get get inspiration yeah yeah heaps of paintings um I love Frida Kahlo um I love her paintings but I guess I also just love her like being and how like powerful and strong she was Mm -hmm. through everything that happened to her and um I love Goya um how like dark some of his paintings are and like in the time when paintings were very like beautiful and like I guess painted of like the beautiful depiction of religion whereas he started painting the more darker side Mm -hmm. like early on Mm -hmm. um which was like changed the history of painting I guess um um, oh man there's so many amazing painters out there I feel like everything's been done yeah I I, I kind of just tried to think like I just kind of do what happens. Mm-hmm, it just mm-hmm. kind of paints its own picture. Yeah. 
What about travel? What um, I, you you mentioned earlier that you travel a lot. What what do you like about traveling? I love seeing different buildings, <laughs> um, and yeah, just like meeting diff- like getting into different cultures. But when I travel, like it's usually with like Billabong or like on a surf trip. So like I don't really get to like submerge in the culture too much. So I'd really like to travel a bit more where I have a bit more time in the place to like really connect and yeah yeah I feel like I've got a lot to learn still um, yeah. but I I also love the downtime and traveling in the airports and kind of that's where I seek a lot of ins- inspiration on my way home from a trip I'll be like write down like some experiences and what I've learned and different things I've seen and it's always like I always come home like super inspired. Yeah, I do too. I there's some, I feel I've traveled a lot throughout my life and I feel strangely very very comfortable in airports. Um either international airports or or foreign airports where I don't know, I'm I'm being uh on the outside of things. There's there's something actually re- really kind of liberating about that I find. Yeah, yeah, I love sitting in an airport and like yeah, it's just an interesting place. I feel like cuz you Time doesn't really exist. You just you're bouncing around, and it's just interesting to see like where your brain goes. I love doing writing there, or like drawing. And there's like no like it's hard to procrastinate because you kind of just like you've got what you've got. I've usually got a book and a drawing book and mm-hmm. um, movies and stuff. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's fun. What about? I know you're injured now, but if you weren't injured and you were in, you were home. What would be like a typical day in your life? It would probably be wake up, go for a surf, come home, make breakfast, maybe get into the veggie garden, um, maybe make a song, go for a bike ride, go for a bush walk looking for snakes <laughs> with, my, with Luca, um, fil- film some wildlife. It's pretty similar what I'm doing now, just take away the surfing part. Yeah. Now that I can walk and stuff again um, without limping and it's not really too painful. Yeah, we've been kind of just doing that. Mm-hmm. Do you cook a lot? <laughs> yeah, I love cooking. I actually, like, what's the time now? It's only 9.50 and I already put dinner in the slow cooker. So the house smells freaking amazing. <laughs> How nice. And um, do you, you know, it's interesting because the Byron Bay part of the world has always been very uh there's a lot of clean living and clean eating there i mean i've I've always associated it with uh i have a lot of sort of for lack of a better description hip hippie friends who live in that area who are vegetarian who who you know grow their own food etc yeah i think um growing your own food is so important um it's so fulfilling and fun and it's just like it's just like just such an obvious way it's like we all have to eat and it's actually so easy to grow um and I love having a veggie garden to like get your greens out of so fresh like because you know when you buy like a big thing of lettuce you use like a few pieces and then it gets all wilted in the fridge and it's kind of fucked um so it's like and it's so easy to have your own lettuce growing mm-hmm. i mean that's if you have a backyard but even if you don't have a backyard you can have a few pots with um some lettuce in there and then you can just cut the outsides or just take what you need um and yeah you don't it doesn't have pesticides and and building your own compost it's just like it's just so awesome i recommend everyone try to have a veggie garden yeah and i love growing flowers and stuff too but it, to put your effort into growing things you can eat, I think just makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What about, I have a question. Uh, if you were talking to, if younger girls who are inspired by you and are interested in surfing, what advice would you give them? What, what advice would you give to like a 11 or 12 year old girl? My advice, I feel like it'll sound corny, um, but I guess just be yourself and surf exactly how you want to um but and just keep things will like pop up and just take those opportunities 
if you want to. Um, your parents don't know everything and um, and I don't know. I feel like my younger self, I like so I grew up like as a dancer and I was like super girly and then I became really, really tomboy because I wanted to like fit in with like I didn't have many girl surfer friends when I first started surfing so I really wanted to hang out with all the boys so I just wanted to make myself look like a boy I really just wanted to be a boy um so that's when I think I lost myself for ages because I was just trying to be a boy and be a surfer um because like I watched surf movies as a grommet the ones that my, my brother was watching and there was only male surfers in them and the only females I saw was like girls topless tanning on the beach and stuff like that so I I considered females kind of like just sexual things and I didn't want to be part of that I wanted to be the boy surfing in the movie um and but it's really sad that I had to shut off being a girl in my own eyes to then be a surfer to do sports and stuff um and so only like recently have I like reconnected to my female self and I can be a tomboy and like a sassy girl as well Mm -hmm. and like you can be both Mm -hmm. so that's what I mean when I say be yourself like you can be like in and in and out of the water like your attitude and your personality like just embrace the weirdness <laughs> yeah no I, um, I, 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 feel, I don't know if that would help a 10 year old I, I I like struggle like knowing what age kids are <laughs> right. but I would just support them and um keep like keep doing your drawings and keep living in your own little world and don't take things too serious <laughs> we all want to grow up so fast like I did when I was little I just like wanted to be an adult <laughs> and like I wish I enjoyed being a kid more. <laughs> yeah. I think what you say, though, is it, it, it's sort of like it could apply to a, a 10 or 11-year-old or 12-year-old girl, but it could apply to almost anyone for that matter. Because it really is – it's hard. Um, the one thing I can say is as a as a middle-aged adult man, life still feels a lot like high school. Like I look around and it's still – people are – there's a hierarchy, there's a wanting to fit in, there's a need to be uh, appreciated and loved. And I, what I thought, I thought, I sort of, when I was younger, I thought the adults around me had, had it figured out for whatever reason, just by virtue of like living 40 years on earth, you'd, you'd think that people would sort of gain some kind of knowledge of themselves, knowledge of how the world works, knowledge of how to be in the world. But it really, I still, I'm still, I'm still trying to figure it out. And I, and I, that's one of the reasons why I love doing this podcast. Like I, I'm old, I'm older than you, but I, I look to someone like you just to, I'm, I'm inspired. And I think um, that thing of embracing your own weirdness is such a, it sounds like a little buzzword, but it, it's a hard thing to actually do because I think, especially when you're younger, um, you want to fit, you want to maybe not you want to like fit in, but you also want to be into your own individual self. But there's like identity is just this thing you grapple with and try to, it's a struggle and it's a struggle your entire life, you know? Yeah, definitely. And we're still like, like I'm still character building now, I guess. And like, I don't know where I'm going to go in the future, but yeah, just try my hardest to like, not, and especially in this world of social media and the job I have where I do know that I guess, people are watching what I'm doing or whatever and just to like it's it's easy to do um the mundane I guess which is fine too as long as it makes you happy but like so like you know so many people tell me to try to like oh no do this like especially with Billabong like make it like more in the Billabong vibe or whatever but I'm like I just want to through the Jaleesa vibe and like let's try to meet in the middle at least Mm -hmm. um and it's easy to like just step down and do what people want you want you to do but it kind of for me it it crushes my dreams and I'm still like it's still a challenge to be myself because yeah you're always going against the grain which is a bit scary and vulnerable um and takes a lot more effort well like not effort because it's what you naturally want to do 
but like it's like you've really got to do it on your own kind of luckily I've got like my partner who's like so supportive and he's very similar we're very like like-minded people so when we're just hanging out together we feel like we're so normal and then when we bring the proposal to other people they're like what the fuck are you guys talking about we're like what it's a great idea uh-huh, uh-huh. and like it's, yeah um it's fun and just like just back yourself and then yeah if it fails start working on your next project and what does failing even mean it, it's like the art is the process in itself it's the ideas it's the talking it's the getting excited it's the buzz it's like you wake up and you've got some purpose I guess which is what we're all searching for yes <laughs> it's just a bit of purpose yeah I like that a lot well cool well thank you Jalisa thanks guys bye-bye <laughs> See ya. Soundings is produced by me, Jamie Brissick, and Jonathan Shiflett. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Our theme song is Give Me Away by Oscar Matsumiya and Paz Lenchanton. Soundings is brought to you by The Surfer's Journal, a reader-supported publication, made possible by sponsorship from FCS, Finisterre, Howler Brothers, Patagonia, Rainbow, Bands, and Yeti. The journal is published bi-monthly. If you haven't done so already, I encourage you to visit surfersjournal.com and subscribe. Thank you so much for listening to Soundings. We appreciate you. And until next time.